This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. We're getting into allergy season, so if you hear me rattling a bottle of meds during the show, mind your business. Here's what we got for y'all. The pandemic has exacerbated this country's digital divide, despite billions of federal dollars going to companies to address the problem. We'll tell you more about who is being impacted the hardest. Plus, a new report takes stock of our collective mental health during COVID and how that's affected the stigma around mental wellness. But first, here's what you need to know right now. The U.S. is still averaging around 50,000 new cases of COVID-19 each day. After a sharp drop from the winter surge, the case count has started to plateau over the last few weeks. That has public health experts worried that the U.S. could be in for another spike, especially as spring break travel approaches and more states ease restrictions. I'm pleading with you for the sake of our nation's health. These should be warning signs for all of us. Cases climbed last spring, they climbed again in the summer. They will climb now if we stop taking precautions. The good news is vaccine distribution and administration continues to ramp up. On Saturday alone, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention said more than four and a half million vaccines had been administered nationwide. It's hard to predict when this pandemic will end, but U.S. officials have been teasing this summer's 4th of July as a date when friends and family should be able to gather without significant health concerns. Last week, President Biden urged states to make every adult eligible to receive a vaccine by the 1st of May. The president indicated that if we all do our part, by the 4th of July, um, we should be able to take a really important step to bringing the things, the people, the events in our lives um, back into our lives. That's an if. That's, that's really on, on all of us. Meanwhile, parts of Europe are backsliding in their fight against COVID, as many cities in Italy are now going back into lockdown. It comes after the nation's daily case count topped 26,000, a record for Italy not seen since November. There's also growing concerns about the virus variants, specifically the one first found in the UK, which is more contagious. Derek Chauvin's attorney asked a judge to reconsider a change of venue and delay his trial. Chauvin, a former Minneapolis police officer, faces charges of manslaughter, second-degree murder, and third-degree murder in the death of George Floyd. On Friday, in a separate civil suit, the city of Minneapolis announced a $27 million settlement in a wrongful death suit with Floyd's family. Everybody around this world who have marched with us on the front line, or on the couch, it doesn't matter. Your heart was in a good place, and i like to thank everyone for that. Thank you all so much. May George live in power. The defense attorney argues that settlement could have tainted the jury pool. The judge hasn't ruled on the delay request from Chauvin's attorney yet, but jury selection for the trial continued Monday. The trial is set to begin March 29th. More than 4,000 unaccompanied minors are now crowded into U.S. Border Patrol's short-term holding facilities. Lawyers from the National Center for Youth Law interviewed some of the children who said they haven't been able to shower. Others said they hadn't seen sunlight in days. It's a crisis that both raises human rights concerns and puts a spotlight on the Biden administration, which had promised better treatment of children detained at the border. After these children are taken into Border Patrol custody, they're turned over to the Department of Health and Human Services. Over the weekend, Biden's Secretary of Homeland Security directed FEMA to work with the HHS to try and provide accommodations for the kids. At the peak of the 2019 border crisis, there were roughly 2,600 migrant children in Border Patrol custody. But more migrants, both adults and children, have tried to enter the U.S. since the new president took office. According to a Border Patrol spokesman, that's something that tends to happen after every election cycle. When President Biden announced a 100-day uh, moratorium on um on deportation, some folks uh, took it to mean that it was a 100-day uh, amnesty period for people to come in, which we all know is not the case, but that's what these uh, smugglers are, are telling people so they can you know, get their money and get them to come forward. The pandemic has exposed the deficiencies of the nation's broadband infrastructure. Despite the billions of federal dollars paid to companies to expand high-speed internet, in low-income and rural communities. Newsy's Angela Hill reports on why millions of Americans are still on the wrong side of the digital divide. So no internet access, so then what I have to do is restart my computer. Caroline Roscombs is a first grade teacher in rural Maryland. Sometimes when I'm logging onto my Google Slides, 
Google Slides will not load. That's downtime and it's missed education. The Roscoms don't have access to high speed internet. So here is the router. And then you come up and you kind of fiddle and try to get them tight. It's a problem that hurts the whole family. Her husband, Matthew, also works from home. I was deployed 10 years ago, 2011. I was in Iraq and I had more internet options there 10 years ago than we have here. Yet less than a half a mile down the road, their neighbors have access to broadband. It's very frustrating to know that just up the street, they, they've got all their internet needs taken care of and we are kind of living in the stone age. The Roscoms live on the wrong side of the digital divide. Where broadband is and where broadband isn't, this, this hodgepodge of connected and unconnected zones all interwoven together, they've ended up being quite disastrous for the state of connectivity across the United States. This was not the plan. The federal government has given billions to internet service providers to expand broadband access. But with little government oversight, some experts say thousands of communities still lack the internet service they were promised. Broadband Now, a research organization, reports nearly 42 million Americans don't have access to broadband internet. That's double the number reported by the Federal Communications Commission, which admits its data is flawed. The FCC released its annual broadband progress report. It was a glowing assessment that all is well, but that's just not credible. A newsy analysis of census estimates found from 2017 to 2019, only about half of rural counties saw a measurable increase in the share of households with the Internet. According to the FCC map, the entire area where the Roscoms live has broadband. That's partially because internet companies are only required to say where they can reasonably provide service within a census block. If one house in the census block has broadband, the FCC map considers the entire area served. It presents an overstatement of the availability of broadband connections in that community. It matters because that influences billions of dollars in public funding. Companies are still paid for providing broadband, albeit limited coverage. Yet it prevents many communities from expanding broadband access. If that community is considered served, they are not going to be eligible for for federal dollars, they're also not going to be eligible in many cases for state programs as well. In other cases, companies including Frontier and CenturyLink receive multi-million dollar federal government contracts to deliver broadband across the country, but fail to meet final milestone deadlines. The FCC denied Newsy's request for an interview to discuss these concerns. However, in a congressional hearing last summer, the FCC had this to say. Despite having made no efforts to improve our nation's dubious broadband data, the FCC is about to hand out billions in fixed broadband support with the new Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. You don't have meaningful accountability. What you have is taxpayer dollars being granted to companies without adequate oversight and accountability. Meanwhile, rural and urban communities alike are grappling with what it means to be on the wrong side of the digital divide. This day and age, uh, internet is an essential service. It's every bit as important as power, water. The FCC has launched its broadband data task force, indicating its commitment to improving data, something experts say is critical in closing the digital divide. Angela Hill, Newsy, Washington. When you're back, I'll break down a list of firsts from this year's Oscar nominations. Oscar noms are out, and per usual, there are enough snubs to get my blood pressure up, but not today, Satan. Let's focus on some positives, shall we? Here's what's trending. Monday morning, the Academy announced what might be its most diverse group of nominees ever, which includes a lot of firsts. Viola Davis got a nod for her leading role in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. She made history Monday for becoming the most nominated Black actress ever and the only Black woman with two Best Actress nominations. At this point, we ought to get used to the name Chloe Zhao. The Nomadland director became the 
first Asian woman nominated for Best Director and is the most nominated woman in a single year in Oscar history. Meanwhile, both Steven Yun and Riz Ahmed made history for becoming the first Asian American and first Muslim, respectively, to be nominated for Best Actor. The nominations this year are notable because of how trash the Academy has been at recognizing a wider array of folks in the past. Remember hashtag Oscar so white? The 2015 and 2016 ceremonies didn't see a single person of color nominated in the Best Acting categories. Though this year's diverse nominees are great to see, 89% of nominations in the past decade have gone to white people and 71% have gone to men, according to Insider. The Catholic Church is trending today after the Vatican said the church will not bless same-sex unions. The Vatican said that the message wasn't meant to be discriminatory, but that in the church's view, God cannot bless sin. Pope Francis, who approved the message, has previously spoken about the need for the church to be more inclusive of people from the LGBTQ plus community, and he's even shown support for same-sex civil unions. This latest message seems to clash with that. This comes at a time when parishes and ministers in the US and Germany have begun blessing same-sex unions. A Pew Research poll from 2019 found Catholics around the world varied in their support of same-sex marriage, but in the US, 6 in 10 Catholics say they favor blessing same-sex unions. Somehow, despite a global pandemic, we're still getting March Madness as a treat, and you can now start filling out your soon-to-be busted brackets. The men's bracket dropped over the weekend with Illinois, Baylor, Michigan, and Gonzaga getting number one seeds. And for the first time since 1976, Duke and Kentucky are nowhere to be found. The women's tournament bracket drops Monday night. While we don't yet know how your bracket will disappoint you, we do know that there's a correlation between this moment of March Madness and productivity in the workplace. Human resource experts and researchers have calculated that billions of dollars are lost to the NCAA basketball tournament every year because of the games, the betting, and the... Brackets. And the brackets. The brackets. A new report looks at the global mental health status of the world in the age of COVID. It's rough, but some experts say us all facing the pandemic together is lowering stigma. Newsy's Lindsay Thies reports. One way or another, all of us have been affected by the COVID pandemic. <sighs> Sorry, we haven't paid ourselves since June and I never thought I'd collect unemployment. We're collecting unemployment. One moment. <laughs> Sorry. You may be the last face that someone sees before they're invaded and they won't see anybody else. They won't see their loved one. It's the nurse. So it's, it's hard. A new global report from Sapien Labs and the Mental Health Million Project found more people all over the world are feeling the pain related to mental health disorders like depression, PTSD, and anxiety. I'm yeah. willing to try anything just to feel like me again. The percentage of respondents with clinical level risk increased from 14% in 2019 to 26% in 2020. Researchers broke it down by age group, and this problem was worse among people 18 to 24 years old. 44% of young adults were at risk of a clinical mental health diagnosis. And that's a huge, huge fraction because you can't have a situation where almost half your population is struggling. The big question remains, will that change over time? Some help is coming from the federal government. The newly passed COVID relief bill allocates billions towards mental health, including $3.5 billion for block grants addressing mental health and substance use disorders, $100 million for behavioral health workforce education and training, and $80 million towards pediatric mental health services. Mental health experts that we spoke with say that this pandemic has really lowered the stigma about mental wellness, and that could be a huge help. Mental health care providers right now can't keep up with the large demand of patients. And while on one side, that's obviously very troubling, they also say it's promising because it means more people are open to getting care they need. We've been having more conversations about mental health, but also just the, the importance of making sure that you maintain a, a healthy lifestyle to prevent you from getting to some sort of more severe um, psychological disorders. I am better equipped now to deal with my anxiety disorder. I hope, if nothing else, that this pandemic inspires and encourages people to not only be more open about their mental health, 
folks keep themselves open to hearing more about others' mental health. The saying goes, misery loves company. But with a pandemic, so much of that is already shared. That company could be the thing to help heal. Lindsay Thies, Newsy, San Francisco. Leaders from Black and Asian communities are stressing solidarity during a wave of attacks on Asian Americans. Anti-Asian sentiment is in focus after a spike in attacks on Asian Americans. The group Stop AAPI Hate has reported more than 3,000 incidents since the start of the pandemic. In some cases, perpetrators were Black, leading many Black and Asian community leaders to call for solidarity. Newsy's Kat Sandoval has more. Go to your own country. Attacks on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, or APIs, have gone viral. And in some incidents, the perpetrators are black, leading to some in the API community to address anti-black sentiment. When we put other communities of color down, when we encourage other communities of color to be overrepresented in the criminal justice system, we're really just upholding or uplifting white supremacy. Community leaders want to dispel stereotypes like the criminality of black people and that Asians are the source of COVID. There is an intertwined history between the API and black communities. In the L.A. riots of the 90s, tensions rose between Korean immigrant business owners and black Americans after a 14-year-old black girl was shot and killed by a Korean convenience store owner who thought she was stealing a bottle of orange juice. Asian-American studies professor Janelle Wong says we can learn from this history. Today, Korean-Americans are among the most racially progressive when it comes to for instance, support for Black Lives Matter, and when it comes to the government doing more to create equal rights between Blacks and whites. It took years of coalition building between the Korean American and Black community leaders. When you have narratives that, the, that attempt to divide each other, what you're doing is distracting the root causes to what's impacting both of those communities. Both communities have felt the impact of the pandemic, whether it's job losses, food shortages, or seeking mental health care. Experts say the fight for resources is pitting communities against each other when they could work together. Historically, the AAPI community has benefited from the Black community's fight for civil rights. And many AAPI now, especially the younger generation, understand that our liberation is always bound up with the Black community and other communities of color, and we can't make gains without working together. Local leaders suggest the two communities join forces to push for resources as an alternative to more policing. And that includes youth job placement and investing in anti-poverty programs. For Newsy, I'm Kat Sandoval. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. If you're feeling extra generous, congratulate my fiance on saying yes to me. Yeah, I don't know what she was thinking either. Back in 2016, the movie Hidden Figures introduced many audiences to a special group of NASA's human computers, three black women who were mathematicians during the space race in the 60s. And in case you were wondering, this is a Taraji P. Henson Stan account. At the time, the contributions of women, especially black women, were often overlooked. In celebration of Women's History Month, National reporter Elizabeth Ruiz is highlighting these women and their massive contributions to space exploration decades ago. Successfully getting humans into space and back is risky business, but it was made possible 60 years ago thanks to help from some extraordinary black women known as hidden figures. My name is Duchess Harris, and I'm the co-author of a book called Hidden Human Computers, The Black Women of NASA. And my grandmother was Miriam Daniel Mann, and she was one of the first hidden human computers at NASA. American studies professor Duchess Harris has dedicated a lot of time to researching the legacy of her grandmother. The hidden figures were black women who were human computers at NASA. 
and human computers were women who checked the math of engineers who were men. And this was because women were not allowed to become engineers until the mid-1960s. They were called human computers because this, of course, was before IBM mainframe computers. Acting NASA Chief Historian Brian Odom says their calculations were essential to engineers. When they get all this data back from a test, wind tunnel testing, any type of testing like that, plotting trajectories, it was the job of those women to kind of crunch the numbers, right, to do the math. Dr. Harris says her grandmother had the opportunity to go to college, which was a big deal, considering she was born only 40 years after slavery was abolished. However, women of color like her first broke into the space industry out of necessity. When World War II broke out, NASA needed black women to become computers because there weren't enough educated white women to fill in the spots that were needed because the men were deployed because of the war. That brought man into the highest paying job a black woman could get at the time. She was in the entering class in 1943 of 11 black women who passed the civil service exam. And so she went off to work with an eight-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a six-year-old, and the seven-year-old was my mom. Mann started the job shortly after Franklin D. Roosevelt desegregated federal jobs, but not the physical workspace itself. So the black women were sectioned off to the west side where there were colored signs to label things like the restroom. Dr. Harris says her grandmother did not like those signs. They were actually on the wall. You could slide them off and she'd put them in her purse and then she'd bring them home. And my mother and my uncles would laugh about how their parents would fight about it um, because my grandfather thought, of course, that she'd get in trouble, she'd get fired, and he didn't want her to lose the income. More than 70 years later, Dr. Harris and Odom say it's extremely important to recognize the contributions of these women. Our our job at NASA is to inspire, to inspire people to enter into these very hard fields, difficult fields from a training standpoint, difficult from a professional standpoint, uh, and, and to reach into underserviced, underrepresented groups. Females are still unfortunately part of that. African Americans definitely, African American females. If people don't know what women have done before them, sometimes young boys don't think of women as authority figures and young girls don't think that they can aspire um, for these positions. Odom says without these hidden figures, we likely wouldn't be where we are today. You've got to have a diversity of ideas if you want to do the hard things of space exploration and scientific discovery at that level. And it takes everyone and it takes that intermingling of ideas from, from multiple perspectives. I'm Elizabeth Ruiz reporting. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more in the loop. Same time, same place. Top stories from Newsier headed your way right now.